This is Gail Morgan welcoming you to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Now, your host, James Just. Thank you for joining us today. With me is Richard and John. There we go. We got them in the same picture today. Yeah. And we're everybody's getting prepared for their Thanksgiving. I know it's we record this on a Monday afternoon, but we this will go live to our viewers on Thursday evening. So, so John, I'm going to throw you a little bit under the bus here. What are you thankful for this year? Well, I'm I'm thankful that uh, I'm thankful for my friends, you, Richard. I'm thankful for my family. I'm I'm on a on a in a political note. I'm I'm thankful that that the powers that we let be are screwing up so repeatedly and so badly that that uh, that more and more people are seeing their true colors. So I'm I'm feeling as if there's some hope, uh, some hope, some light at the end of the tunnel that's not an oncoming train. And I'm especially thankful for my health. So I've got a lot of things to be thankful for. Yeah. Thanks for asking. Yeah. How about you, Richard? What are you thankful for this year? Well, you know, I, I'm thankful for, number one, my health, because without health, uh, I'm worthless to, to myself or anybody else. Number two, I'm thankful for uh, my family, uh, because, you know, that's those are the people you can trust. Those are the people that you can uh, that you live with on a day by day basis uh, for better or for worse. And usually it's better. And so I'm thankful that it's better in my case. And I'm thankful that we, that, you know, despite, as John puts it, the powers that we let be, despite their, their power grab over the last, uh, well, the last year in particular, but really the last few decades, uh, we still have a, a nominal amount of, of freedom of speech witnessing you know witnessed by this program we've only been shut down by youtube a couple on a couple of occasions largely uh what we have to say is is uh, uh is unfiltered and unfettered by uh the powers that we let be so I'm, I'm thankful that we have managed to hang on to at least a partial uh remnant of the bill of rights that it, well and did, did I, I i thought i think was said i was thankful for my family and their did I say that? I said friends and I said health and make sure I ditto on that because, you know, that blood's thicker than water. And, and, you know, despite the fact that they drive us crazy, usually they're the reason we get out of bed in the morning and fall asleep at night with a smile on our face. So, you know, I want to make sure that gets out there as well. Yeah. Well, to give my family a reason to watch at the end, I'll tell you all what the, I'm thankful for at the tail end of the show. But for now, you know, this has been a list last week has been a uh, interesting case. An interesting week in the courts. We've got really three trials that are either ending or starting kind of all at the same time. And we'll start with the, the one that's in the news, the Rittenhouse case. And what I have found astonishing is not that people have different, you know, viewpoints on, on the ending, is that on what happened or not, not what happened, but the outcome of the case is that there seems to be a complete disconnect between what re really happened and what some people believe happened. You know, you can have, you can believe the law should be different and the outcome of the court case should be different. That's kind of reasonable. But there seems to be a disconnect where of just literally what happened. We have a bunch of people who are now just at the end of the case figuring out that he didn't kill three black people. He killed three white people or shot three white people, excuse me. And if you watched, I, I actually just watched a, uh, a timeline overview of the case and I didn't know, even I didn't know, that Rosenbaum essentially was the one who started off the whole thing, you know, minutes before the whole shooting. It was Rosenbaum who kind of kicked off the whole altercation to begin with minutes before at a different car lot. And this whole disconnect, this whole realistic, unrealistic disconnect, I guess, between what people think happened and what actually happened is leading to the, uh, I don't know, a disintegration of society. What do you guys think about that? And I think we largely have media to blame for that. Uh, the media, and this is not really new, the media has always been uh, a, a refuge for people who want to uh, pro, pro, uh, want want to make their view of what are, of the world prevalent. Uh, you can go back to colonial times, and there were Democrat papers or Democrat Republican papers and Federalist papers, newspapers. I'm talking about, and they each had their own version of the truth. And if you were, uh, you know, as, as Mark Twain said, if you read the papers, uh, if you don't read the papers, you're uninformed. If you do read the papers, you're misinformed. Uh, and it's, it's amplified in the time of social media and in the time of, uh, 
large corporate control of most of the major mainstream media sources. So, but but we 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 saw the media, if they were on the left, they tried to portray Rittenhouse as a uh, as a, uh, a vigilante, as a, a person who should be uh, executed or you know, lock the lock him up and throw away the key. If you were watching media on the right, he was uh, seen as a uh, supporter of the Second Amendment and uh, uh, the right to self-defense and so forth and so on. And I, I think that what was lost in the whole thing is what the actual trial was about, which was, was he acting in self-defense? The jury correctly decided he was acting in self-defense. That leaves out the larger uh, ethical, moral, what have you question of whether he should have been there in the first place. And I have my own uh, opinion on that is he shouldn't have been. He has, and he should not have uh, subjected himself to that kind of danger. But he did, and he defended himself, and that's what the trial was about. And uh, I, I say, you know, goodbye to the case. Mm. And I'll, I'll kind of echo some of Richard's sentiments. Uh, you know, the prosecution tried to try him for, for uh, you know, basically going to a, a flashpoint with a with a weapon with a loaded weapon and uh, you know tried to paint that as the crime when you know and i agree i think it was a bad moral decision you know you don't need uh although one of the media sources that i that i read said you know the, the cops are there to protect property but you know the cops haven't protected property they've let buildings burn they've let uh, rioters loot looters loot They've, uh, you know, let people you know, violate laws and, you know, haven't even asked who they are, much less arrested them. But, you know, I think, how old is this kid? He's like 18 or something like that. He's 17 he's at the 17, time. Yeah. Gets in his car, you know, gets a, gets a weapon and goes to, you know, protect property. And, you know, just an accident waiting to happen. Yes. But the, the crime that, that the, the, the prosecution failed to prove is that he didn't act in self-defense. He acted in self-defense. You know, again, like Richard said, the moral question is, should he have been in a place where he needed to act in self-defense? And the, the answer is probably no. But, um, you know, and and it's, uh, it's a crazy world we live in because the liberal press, you know, paints him as this, you know, this guy that went there to shoot some people. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I would just... Yeah, this is the last time I ever want to talk about this trial because yeah. it, it it is nice to see, um, you know, the the laws that guarantee us the rights to defend ourselves from violence upheld. Um, guarantee we could us have had we could have had a much more uh, yeah. photogenic and uh, yeah. camera friendly uh, champion of, of the First Amendment yeah. or Second Amendment. And, and but yeah, I, I don't think this should, yeah. this case, any one particular case should be a champion of the Second Amendment. It should, it's uh, you know the details of that particular case. And yeah. I think is how we should approach all these cases. And, yeah. you know, it, the we, in fact, we put, you know, so much emphasis on, you know, this one case, whether it's be for the Second Amendment or whether it's you know, your right to go to a protest or not. You know, I think morally, I think we're all kind of have some culpability in this is we accepted violent protests, whether it's, you know, we didn't do enough over the course of that whole summer to to stop violent protests. And so this thing was bound to happen. Something like this was bound to happen. And unfortunately, it did. And, yeah. you know, what can we learn from that? Yeah. But so, you know, learning from things um, so in a case that is, well, warm some libertarians heart, at least to an extent. Breonna Taylor's boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, was cleared in the shootings of the police officers. Now, they still convicted him on the gun charge, on the po illegal possession of a firearms charge. But he got cleared of all the serious murder charges, uh, the attempted murder charges. So, you know, remember, this is the case where. The police did a no-knock raid onto his onto this house, and he's fired at people he thought was a, you know, home invasion. Yeah, no, I mean the the jury again did the right thing, or the police department in in, in, in that uh, prosecutor and not pursuing the charges did the right thing uh, and cleared him. Now, as far as the gun charge, we as libertarians, of course, would say that everyone has the right to self-defense. There is no such there should be no such thing as an illegal firearm. All firearms in the hands of the someone who has honestly acquired them should, in fact, be legal. Uh, so that's that's a you know that's a that's a crime only because a bunch of people in a legislative chamber decided it's a crime. It's not a crime 
uh, in any moral or uh, ethical sense mm -hmm. or philosophical sense. It's simply the uh, an expression of the right to defend yourself. So, uh, but it, it's good that he at least is not uh, facing a uh, life in, in jail because he happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And the real crime here, of course, is that the uh, police officers, it looked, I guess they're knocked off the force, but I don't hear any, anything about them being prosecuted. Prosecuted uh, for murder is what it should be. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they, they're they operating under the uh, uh, protection of, uh, you, you know, you can't uh, prosecute a federal or a government employee when they're, when they're, you know, doing their, du you know, doing their so-called duty. That's, mm -hmm. that's the real criminal, the, uh, the being shielded from prosecution of government employees. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, you know, this is, we go back to qualified immunity, and you know, I want to echo something that Richard said. You know that what he it was an illegal farm. Was he a felon? Is that why he wasn't supposed to? Yeah, have I, I believe it was drug possession charges. At, even at that, yeah. so you know, for us, it's even worse. So yeah. he was he was a felon because of drug possession charges. Yeah, I believe so. so yes. See, you know the thing about felons. Um, you know, you do if you do the crime, you do the time, and at the end of the time, that should be it. If not, you know, we punish felons in this country forever after they're convicted of felony. So their sentence never ends. They can't become licensed contractors. They can't. Uh, it's very difficult to get them bonded for anything at all. So you can't really run a, a major small business. Can't hold elected office. Can't um, vote in many cases. Can't vote. You can't. And most felons, because they have to take low-level jobs, if they can get low-level jobs, live in, in um, dangerous areas. And they're the very people that need a firearm for self-defense more than anybody else. Yet they're prevented from doing it. And uh, especially for a a non-crime, um, non you know, drug possession, drug use, selling drugs, all the rest of that, that's commerce. And if you substitute the word bread for drugs, then the man should have never gone to jail. And why is one product that people consume better or worse than another product? And, uh, you know, you can do all this moralistic crap about, you know, we got to protect the, the poor, you know, our poor citizenry from using drugs, but we don't protect them from alcohol and, and or and, sugar and, you know, too much, uh, you know, flour, yeah. uh, you know, I mean, there's, a Oh God, guys, don't give them ideas. Please mm -hmm. don't give them ideas. They're good. Well, they've already, you know, they've already <laughs> said in places where, you know, banning uh, large sugary drinks yeah, and all the rest of that. It's the they, are, they already have the ideas. Yeah. yeah oh, man. And of course, the whole idea of no knock warrants is another thing that we. Well, I think no knock warrants have been eliminated in almost every state. They're legal in California, if, I, if I'm if I'm correct. And, you know, they're saying the. the I once think they're, again, they're still legal uh, in a lot of places. Yeah, they're still legal. They should be legal nowhere. Uh, yeah. You know, if you're you're worried that the person's, you know, forewarned is forearmed, well, that's just silly. The only know? the only reason for no knock warrants in the first place was because people were cops were worried about the uh, the so-called uh, criminals destroying the evidence, which in most cases was the drug that they were trying. Yeah, to Yeah, they were worried about the drugs getting flushed down the toilet, which means they're willing to put people's lives at risk over evidence, <laughs> which. You know, what are you really trying to do? Are you really trying to, well, you know, to help it, and solve people and yeah. save people? Or are you trying to just convict people? Yeah. And, and if you look at, you think about it, if it's, if it's a product that somebody can flush down the, the toilet and it disperses in the waterways and you've either got some happy fish or some sleepy fish, um, you know, why shouldn't people consume it? And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's just a mess. The whole, you know, it, really when you look at it, if you look at unintended consequences long enough, they become con uh, intended consequences. And and by now, these this war on drugs has has gone on long enough to where it is obviously what it was intended to be, which is a war. It's war on black people. It's a war on poor people. It's a full employment act for for people for lawyers, for judges, for cops, and for prison guards. And, um, you know, if, if you see what's happening any other way, you're not bright enough to be able to allow it to, to, you shouldn't be able to drive a car because you're not smart enough to drive a car if you don't see that these you're dumber than You're dumber than people that have been, been blowing, blowing marijuana smoke for the last yeah, uh, yeah, 20 years. Yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> I know an awful lot of smart people who smoke pot every single day. Uh, and uh, so it's just, it's, it's the big lie told over and over and over again, you know, like a, I think we're going to touch on another big lie that, that uh, 
that we're finally getting smart enough to see through. But I think we beat this one to death. Anyway. Yeah, well, yeah, we talked about uh, smoking pot every day. In Rolling Stone magazine, they were discussing this. Oh, Gazane, how do you pronounce her name? Does anybody know? Gazane, Gazane Maxwell. Gazane Maxwell. She's the daughter of, a, uh, uh, of an infamous publisher by the name of Maxwell who uh, ended up committing suicide rather than go bankrupt. Yeah, her trial has started last week. They did jury selection last week. And I guess at the end of the show, I guess her trial starts the 29th. But what is interesting is the is in Rolling Stones, it's the celebrities and the celebrity culture is all up in arms and all worried about what is going to come out during the trial. They're not worried about why. I wonder why she was the, uh, you know, what she's being tried for essentially is being the procurer for uh, Epstein. Uh, and we know that Epstein provided, uh, or we, we think we know that Epstein uh, provided uh, uh, willing women, let's put it that way, or girls, underage girls, to uh, celebrities, including uh, former President Clinton, including President, uh, former President Trump, including Prince Andrew, including a whole lot of other names who are probably really, really nervous right now that their name is going to be dragged into the spotlight, into the air of, uh, of uh, in, into the clear air of transparency uh, as a result of this trial. So it'll be interesting to me to see whether or not this trial gets, and a lot of people in the media probably as well. Uh, right. So it'll be interesting to see whether this trial gets the wall-to-wall -wall coverage that the uh, the uh, trials that we previously discussed got. Yeah, and I there there's there's something else to that. Richard said you know, pr probably, and let's make sure that we're very clear on this in the show, we're not stating that we have proof that, that you know, President Clinton or um, President, <clears throat> former President Clinton or former President Trump or Prince Andrew or, or any of these other people, uh, you know, actually had young ladies procured for them. That's the rumor. And, you know, the, if, you, if the rumor's out there often enough, uh, then you know, chances are there's a grain of truth, but we're not saying that we absolutely know these people did that. But we're, we're, what we are seeing is the celebrities running scared. And, you know, in essence, I don't know whether Gislaine, Gislaine, whatever her name is, I don't know whether, um, you know, she was the procurer. She was certainly close enough to Epstein to see what was going on and, and be complicit in, you know, some of the things. But she's actually being tried in absentia for him uh, because he, he couldn't go to trial because he, committed suicide uh and you know anytime somebody who's got a bunch of dirt on on politicians and powerful people commit suicide no matter how open and shut uh the so-called facts are i always i always wonder personally well i guess i write i write thrillers too so i wonder all, every time whether you know that suicide's a real suicide but you know she's being tried in absentia uh for his crimes which is well wrong. yeah yes yes well yes and no yeah. i mean She's also being, you know, if you believe the rumors or the uh, accusations, yeah. she was in the room while uh, Epstein was being uh, serviced, to put it uh, uh, relatively politely, by underage women. Yeah, and so she's, she's either uh, an, an accomplice before the fact or after the fact. Uh, she's guilty. but Could be guilty. Yeah, we, could, be, could, yeah. be, could be guilty if the facts demonstrate that. Um, I don't you know, know how any of these facts are going to be uh, yeah, proved, but yeah. it'll be interesting. Interesting to watch if the media actually covers this with any degree of uh, yeah. of uh, uh, thoroughness. Well, we know one thing: even if they cover it thoroughly, they won't cover it objectively. We know that. We know that. Yeah. Well, I think it's it'll be interesting. The Kate, the port, the trial will actually let us know what her role in this was. I mean, hopefully, that's what we'll find out in the trial: is what her role in this whole kind of disgusting madness was and it, maybe we can find out exactly what was actually going on because but what i do find what the the way the media is or isn't covering this thing to be interesting you know it's we're talking sex and celebrities and you know and more it, this should be front page news all the time and they somehow don't so you actually wonder how many of them are they actually going to end up talking about it, you know, I didn't intend I know, to. I know to... what uh, what uh, a lot of people are really worried about is that Maxwell may take the stand and name names. That that will, <laughs> you know, that's that's what the tabloids, of course, are dreaming of, and what uh, the people whose names might get exposed are deathly afraid of. Well, yeah, and I I 
you know, when I when I said that, let's make sure that we don't say we have facts of of these things. We we do know lots and lots of numbers. We know that uh, that uh, um, is it William Jefferson Clinton? Is that his name? That he visited uh, the 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 very suspicious island with Epstein on a whole lot of occasions. Uh, so you know, it's this is the mass. It's the, cir a, the circumstantial evidence is it's, pretty. It's pretty, it's pretty astounding, and I think we should we should probably give this one a pass at, at some point very quickly too, so that we can get on to some no no pun intended. Actual, meteor, actually, yeah, meteor actually, actually yeah. serious issues. Serious yeah. issues. Yeah. Yeah, well, we got a couple serious issues. Let's see. I think John mentioned this one earlier, so we'll bring it up. Doctors in England are now going to allow you to allow doctors to prescribe vape pens to people who want to get off of cigarettes because they've figured out that you know vaping is better for you than smoking. Now, this is not actually come as a surprise to those of us who follow these issues, but to some policymakers, it sure is going to come as a surprise. Well, and also the the, the FDA has approved uh, one vape pen here in, in the U.S. for the same thing because the, the FDA, you know, and, and all the rest of the people are finally coming around to what, what anybody with a modicum of sense reading anything over the last 10 years about medical news has known all along that, you know, what, what, what kills people and gives them emphysema and hardening the arteries and strokes and all the rest of that is nicotine is an addictive drug and it's a vasodilator i think and so it's it's not you know it's not something that you want to casually do but what what kills people is the smoke the smoke the, the tar the you know the tar and all the rest of that stuff and you know i smoked for god knows 20 years and quit uh and uh it's tough i know i don't you know i don't judge anybody who can't but you know, if you can simply, you know, get the feeling of, of pulling something into your lungs, which replaces that heavenly smoke. You know, if anybody smoked, they'll know what what I what it means when I say heavenly, and and allows you to, you know, titrate yourself down or, or dose yourself down is a wonderful thing. And you know, all the other methods like gum and patches and all the rest of that don't seem to be as successful. But in England where they, they actually don't politicize medical stuff nearly as much as we do. People have been very successful getting off and staying off cigarettes. And if that's even if all of those people stayed on vaping products for the rest of their lives, the, the, the ill effects would be about 1% of them if they stayed on cigarettes. And so, you know, the fact that it's getting in the news and the fact that the FDA is approving one here and is starting to be talked about uh, you know, shame on cities like San Francisco, and I think San Jose was going to make it illegal, and probably L.A., you know, that make vaping of anything illegal. What what they're, they're doing is they should just admit that they're working for big tobacco. Well, the, I mean, and I think you have to get to the underlying philosophy of those who would ban vaping. And the underlying philosophy is that we must prevent all harm to people, even if uh, in preventing uh, harm A, we're encouraging even worse harm B, uh, and the harm A that they're they're trying to prevent is the uh, allure of, in particular, flavored, uh, fruit flavored, whatever, uh, vaping products for teenagers. Mm. And there is some evidence that shows that teenagers that uh, start vaping uh, end up smoking cigarettes at a higher uh, prevalence than those who never experiment with vaping. Mm. Now. You can certainly make the argument that that's, uh, even though there's a correlation, there's no causal. You can certainly make the argument that those uh, teenagers who are attracted to vaping would eventually be attracted to smoking uh, in the absence of vaping. It's just, it's a personality difference that makes people uh, experiment with uh, smoking anything. It's not, it's not that uh, vaping leads to smoking. It's that a personality that wants to vape is probably going to want to smoke. Uh, want to in, induce, introduce some, want to experiment with uh, something in their lungs or, or elsewhere. So, so the, the the whole idea that we as a society can prevent all harms by making harm illegal is fallacious. We can prevent harms by education. We can prevent harms by uh, telling people, uh, our, our kids and others that are that we're close to, that uh, these things or those things are dangerous and should be avoided. We can't prevent individuals from doing harm to themselves. 
we can talk a lot about it, but we can't actually actually do it mm. as a society or individually. And I want to add something that Richard talked about, no causal, you know, it might be associated with. There's some pretty strong studies out of places that have banned um, uh, vaping, especially the the tasty vaping products that, that teenagers like to use, that, that more kids take up smoking. And those numbers are there. So... You know, the idea that, that as Richard said, that you, harm, you, you make every harm illegal, even if, if harm B is killing about a million people a year, which is what I think smoking does in this country, uh, and harm A would kill, I don't know, what, 10,000? Uh, or none. Then, or none, you know, I mean, because, the, the, I mean, yeah, if you, you nicotine's a poison. If you extract enough, you can kill somebody with it, but you can't get that vaping. But you know, the, the same thing, we've got this uh, fentanyl crisis going on because doctors rightfully years ago uh, prescribed medicine for people who are in tremendous pain. And then the FDA decided to step in and, and prevent them from doing that. And you got a bunch of people addicted. So they went out <coughs> on the street looking for drugs and what they're buying instead of Oxy and Vicodin is everything is, is fake pills laced with fentanyl and they're dying like flies. So that you could eliminate that harm in a microsecond by simply allowing a doctor pres to prescribe opioids to anybody who could prove that they were addicted to them. Because opioids, if they were legally grown instead of illegally grown, are like any other crop, dirt cheap. You, the deaths would go away overnight. But our, because of this mixed up legal system, and, and drug laws that we have, we're just we're just going to say, oh yeah, we'll accept a hundred thousand deaths. That's crazy. Yeah, and the I'm done desire. With my rant. I'm done with my rant. <laughs> yeah, the desire to to prevent harm causes its own harm, and many of the people who want to prevent harm don't even look at the harm. They won't, won't even examine the harm that they're going to cause by their policies. And you know, as we come to the you know the end of the show, you know, I'm thankful. We talk about how we're thankful. I'm thankful to John and, and Richard for, you know, helping me, helping us keep the show going during these times when we've been out the studio. I'm thankful for Access Sacramento and all those people down there at Access Sacramento who have worked hard to get us back into the studio. It looks like we're getting back into the studio soon. So we're hoping that's a, you know, that comes across, that comes across. And the community who watches us, lets us into our homes and into your ears and into your brains every week. You know, I'm thankful for that. You know, I'm thankful for my family who has helped me through the last seven, eight months of my health issues. John, I mean, Richard talked about his health and, you know, it's been a strange health journey for me these last number of months. And, you know, our friends and family, our libertarian community who supports this is, uh, you know, my thanks to them. My thanks to all of you and to my mother. Thank you for all you do. I love you. And to all of you, please remember to love everybody. Thank you very much, James. Thanks, James. Thanks, James. Thanks for the closing sentiment this time of year. It's always, it's, it's great to try to remember the things that we need to be thankful for. Thank you for watching the Libertarian Counterpoint. Listen each week in Sacramento on Comcast Channel 17 for Knuckleheads of Liberty on Monday at 5.30 p.m. and the Libertarian Counterpoint show on Thursday at 8 p.m.